you've already heard in the, in the first day, day and a half, uh, a lot about the foundations of Austrian economics, uh, the Austrian method, a little bit about the history of the Austrian school, principles of value and exchange, a little bit on pricing and so on. Uh, today we're going to look at another foundational topic, the theory of production or the theory of the firm. Uh, it's an extremely important topic uh, for Austrian economics and one that we'll be building on in, uh, in uh, more advanced lectures during the week. Um, let me begin by asking what a firm looks like. What, what is a firm? Well, if I asked you to draw a picture of a firm, or if you asked, if we put, took, took a typical person on the street down here and asked them, what does a firm look like? They would give them the paper, they would draw something like this. Okay, that's a firm. Um, if you've had an economics class at your home university, you know, of course, that this is not what a firm looks like at all. A firm looks like that. <laughs> Maybe that's the roof. Or, I mean, of course, if you've been to graduate school, you know a firm looks like that. Um, but what, what really do we, I mean, what, what, do we mean, what do we mean by a firm anyway? I mean, the way you learn it in, in college and in graduate school, the sort of standard, mainstream, neoclassical approach to the firm, does not really describe firms in the sense that's important. Um, in the standard neoclassical treatment, uh, the emphasis is on technology rather than subjective valuation. It's really, a, really almost an engineering approach to the firm rather than an economic approach, as we'll see a little bit later. Um, there's no room in the mainstream neoclassical approach for the, uh, to the firm for the most important agent in production, namely the entrepreneur. Uh, there's no entrepreneur whatsoever in neoclassical production theory. Everything takes place in a very sort of mechanized, routinized, almost automatic fashion. Uh, there's no theory of investment uh, in the standard treatment of the firm. There are no investors at all. Where investors exist, they're very passive peripheral players who supply capital to the firm at the going market price of capital, but are otherwise completely uninvolved. Um, and really, uh, at the end of the day, there's very little insight uh, into the firm as what it really is, namely a structure or a set of property rights. Okay, if we think about a firm in the common sense notion, General Motors or IBM or Microsoft, right? what is it? Well, it's a set of assets that are owned by somebody, owners of the firm. It can, make, it can write contracts, it can engage in business activities, but ultimately there are some productive assets that are owned by somebody. It, ultimately, the firm, theory of the firm is a theory about property rights. We'll come back to that point in just a moment. Um, but there's no ownership in the standard neoclassical approach to the firm. Um, also, very uh, little or nothing on how firms are structured, organized, governed, managed, financed, and so on. If we think about the firm as an organization employing different individuals, there's a question of how their activities are to be coordinated or harmonized. How will authority be delegated from the top to lower levels of the organization? How will employees be monitored and evaluated and so on? These are all questions that lie beyond the scope of the neoclassical approach to the firm. Um, before we get into an alternative presentation, let me just clarify uh, my terminology. Um, when, when we use the term theory of the firm, there are at least two different aspects, uh, or two different senses in which that, that term is used. One is what we might call the theory of production, the production approach to the firm, where we discuss uh, the, the structure of capital in the economy or the structure of production in the economy, how factors of production are priced, how do we understand the costs to the entrepreneur as the entrepreneur engages in business activities? So really, here we're not so much thinking of the firm as a legal entity, but rather of, of a production process. So the firm in this approach is just a synonym for a productive unit or a productive pro production process. So the, what we might call the theory of the firm more narrowly, the theory of the firm per se, is the is an explanation for the existence, nature, activities, structure of the firm as a legal entity. Why, why do we have firms in the first place? Why does the entrepreneur find it necessary to establish a firm to engage in his or her activities? 
uh, what determines the size and scope of the firm, how big will it be, how many different activities will be undertaken within it, and so on. How should the firm be organized and managed? So these are more managerial or organizational aspects to the firm. And I want to spend a few minutes talking about both of these different approaches. Um, let's start with the uh, pro uh, theory of production. Um, how many of you have had a mainstream course in sort of intermediate micro theory where you drew all the cost curves and maybe did math problems? How many of you have had a course like that? So many of you have been exposed to sort of the standard production theory. Um, and really what's done in this approach is fairly straightforward. We start with the assumption that all prices are exogenous to the decision maker. Okay, so output prices and input prices are determined in perfectly competitive markets. Uh, the firm, the decision maker, takes those prices as given and finds the profit maximizing level of output using a diagram or by taking a derivative, depending on how it was presented to you. Um, and and we, we can make that model fancier uh, by uh, letting the firm face a downward sloping demand curve for its product rather than a perfectly elastic horizontal demand curve. Uh, incorporating some additional decision variables besides simply the level of output. Maybe which prices to charge to which class of customers, so-called price discrimination. The decision to produce one product or many products. And maybe a little bit of strategic interaction among firms. Of course, that's been a very hot area in mainstream industrial organization, the game theoretic approach to strategic interaction. But this really isn't an economic theory at all. And it certainly isn't a theory of the firm. Um, there's some serious problems with it. Uh, first, this approach is completely timeless. There's no passage of time in neoclassical production theory. It's a, a single moment instantaneous optimization problem. Whereas if we think about production in the real world, production doesn't take place instantaneously, but it takes place through time, through the passage of real calendar time. If you're going to start a company that produces bottled water, right? First, you have to you have to uh, acquire factors of production, machines, raw materials. You have to hire labor long before you've sold your first bottle of water. Okay, and by the time you have actually produced output and have brought it to market and have advertised it and engaged in marketing and have contracted with retailers and so on, so you're ready to make your first sale. Circumstances, market conditions may be different from what you imagined they would be when you started uh, organizing the factors of production. In other words, there is uncertainty in the real world, but we don't have uncertainty in the uh, standard neoclassical approach to production. Output prices are known with certainty when decisions about input purchases, production technology, level of output, and so on, when those decisions are made. Um, This idea that we start by taking prices as given, as determined in perfectly competitive markets, and then decide what the, use that to determine what the firm's going to do, which then affects the prices that are actually paid, is a circular argument. Okay, so there's no causality in the standard approach. Just as in, in, in most all of neoclassical economics, there's no notion of purpose, action, means and ends. Instead, the emphasis is on simultaneous determination, right? Finding a solution to a set of equations where every variable simultaneously determines every other variable. Okay, so there's no cause and effect in the standard approach. In the Austrian approach, by contrast, as elaborated by Menger and his disciples, what, what, what we as economists are interested in is providing a causal explanation of what goes on in the real economy. That's why we sometimes describe the Mengerian Austrian approach as causal realist or causal realistic economic analysis, as opposed to mechanistic simultaneous determination style of economic analysis. Um, another, another problem is we might say that the neoclassical theory places its emphasis on the wrong problems. In other words, the standard problem that those of you who took a course like this were exposed to was, you know, given the set of circumstances, find the level of output that maximizes profit level. Okay, everything is told 
It's as if you were the manager of a plant, and your decision is how, how much to ramp up production that day. You've got, there's, a, there's machines producing stuff, and you've got a big lever that controls how fast the machines run, and your job is to put that lever in the right place. Okay, there are no other decisions that you, that you face. Um, well, I mean, is, is, is that really the most important problem that a business firm faces in the economy? Why did that firm or production process tend to be there in the first place? Who had the idea to put those machines there? Why is this product being produced and not some other product? Who determined that they were willing to invest their capital in this activity? What is the return to those investors? Why did they make the decisions that they did? So the whole sort of standard approach is told, it's really from the perspective of the plant manager, not from the perspective of the entrepreneur, the perspective of the financier or capitalist, or the perspective of any of the actual critical decision makers in, in production. Okay. Um, how do the Austrians approach these problems? Well, you've already been exposed to a little bit of this in your, in your preliminary lectures, and you'll hear more uh, throughout the week. Um, Austrian production theory was in Austrian economics from the beginning. Uh, Menger, in his Principles of Economics, 1871, uh, has an explanation of what he called different orders of goods. So you have consumer goods as what Menger called the lowest or lower order goods, and then producers' goods, or factors of production, namely goods that are used to produce other goods, as what he called higher order goods. And then there are the goods that are used to produce those goods, which are still higher, and so on. Right? So if we think of bottled water as a consumption good, okay, the uh, uh, factory and equipment and labor used to produce this bottled water is a higher order good than the water itself. And the machines and labor used to build those machines to set up the plant, to construct the plant, and so on, are yet higher orders of goods, and so on. Uh, 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 Menger's student and, and great disciple, Bon Bavark, um, elaborated on the Mengerian theory and developed it in new directions uh, in the late 19th century. Uh, both Mises and Hayek made pioneering contributions to the Austrian theory of capital. Uh, there's probably the most detailed treatment to date is in Rothbard's Man, Economy, and State, right in the middle of, uh, of the book, uh, chapters 5 through 9. In fact, um, if you think about it, there, there's, there's more in Man, Economy, and State on production theory than any other topic in Rothbard's great two-volume work. So clearly he saw this as sort of the heart of Austrian economic theory, uh, yet it doesn't always receive the attention that it deserves, perhaps because it's regarded as a sort of a mundane, not very exciting topic. Um, but certainly that isn't the way the Austrians have seen it. Uh, Ludwig Lachmann's uh, 1952 book, Capital and Its Structure, uh, provides a nice synthesis and elaboration of the Austrian theory of capital as developed by Lachmann's predecessors. So what kinds of issues are we interested in? How factors are priced? How factors are used? What determines which factors will be used in which production processes? Um, how factors will be combined by entrepreneurs? Uh, so this is really the structure of production analysis that is familiar to many of you from Austrian business cycle theory. So have you seen this kind of picture before, the triangle, the Hayekian triangle? You'll see that in more detail later in the week. Um, but when we're doing uh, Austrian business cycle analysis, thinking of the, 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 the breadth and depth of the economy's capital structure, we're doing production theory. Um, I'm going to talk in just a moment about uh, the theory of profit and loss and how the entrepreneur enters the picture. So anytime we discuss entrepreneurial profit and loss, we're really talking about the production process. Okay? Just a few words about factor pricing. What do we mean by factors of production? Yeah, and these are, these are inputs into the production of process, uh, into the production process. Inputs that are used to produce outputs that are consumed by us, by consumers. Okay? So land, labor, including management. Management would be part of labor as well. So human services that are provided so is the labor factor of production. And capital goods. Uh, one of the great contributions of the Austrian school historically has been the development of what came to be known as the theory of imputation. Theory of imputation, namely, where do 
factors of production get value. In other words, what determines how much an entrepreneur is willing to pay for the services of a factor of production? What determines how factors of production are priced? Why would anyone be willing to employ factors of production? What do they get out of it? Uh, and, and you see right away the problem. Namely, if we look at consumer goods, right, take this bottle of water. Why would I be willing to pay a dollar or whatever I pay to get a bottle of water? Well, it's because I get utility or satisfaction from consuming it. Right? I mean, I'm able to achieve the desired end of quenching my thirst by consuming this bottle of water. So it's obvious why I would be willing to part with some of my own hard-earned goods and services, money, in exchange for this uh, um, water that I consume directly. Right, but what about you know, hiring an employee? I mean, say I employ Mark Thornton to work in my water producing plant. So I own a factory that produces these bottles. And I'm willing to pay to have him around. I pay him a wage to have him work in my shop. Why do I do that? Well, I hate to tell you, but it's not because I consume the satisfaction of having him around. I mean, Mark's a nice guy and all, but I wouldn't be willing to pay just to have him in my presence. Okay, I don't consume him being there. Right? I don't get utility out of Mark being around. Sorry, Mark. Um, what I do consume, or what I do desire, is the dollars I can earn from selling the water that Mark's labor produces. Okay, so my demand for Mark's services doesn't, doesn't come directly from the satisfaction of consumer wants, but it does come from it indirectly, right? My willingness to pay for Mark services is derived from your willingness to pay for bottled water, if he's a bottled water worker, okay? So this is a little bit more complicated. We have to sort of think through, well, how much would I pay him? Why would that change? And so on. Uh, this is what the Austrian theory of imputation attempts to uh, explain. And let me just read, I'm going to read you these definitions and then explain what they mean. Uh, the theory says that the rental prices, the prices that you pay to use the factor of production, the, the rental prices of factors tend to equal their discounted marginal revenue products. Again, just so you have it in your notes, uh, notice I've written some qualifiers in here. The rental prices of nonspecific isolable factors used in variable proportions. You want me to say that three times fast? The rental prices of non oh, just once. The rental prices of nonspecific isolable factors used in variable proportions tend to equal their discounted marginal revenue products. Whereas the rental prices of other factors, factors that don't meet those qualifiers, uh, are, are set by bargaining between resource owners and entrepreneurs. Now, I want to explain what discounted marginal revenue product is, and I want to explain what nonspecific, isolable, and variable proportions mean. Okay? I'm going to do so with some examples. But first, just for definitions, uh, a, a, a mar marginal revenue product is the additional revenue earned by the entrepreneur from using one more unit of a factor. Okay? The additional revenue the entrepreneur earns from employing one more unit of the factor. Right? So if I rent the services of an additional machine, how much more do I earn in dollars from the consumer goods that are produced by that machine that I then go and sell? Okay? So if I hire Mark Thornton for one more hour, right, how much more, how many more bottles of water can he produce in that additional hour and how much can I sell them for? Right? That tells me the additional revenue I earn from employing an hour, an additional hour of Mark Thornton's services. Notice that to determine my willingness to pay for that hour of labor, we also need to include the time factor. Right? So if there's some lapse of time between when I have to pay him and when the bottled water is sold, we need to discount my willingness to pay according to time preferences or by the, uh, according to using the interest rate. Okay, so my willingness to pay for his services is given by the discounted marginal revenue product of his service. Okay? Um, some factors of production have the properties that are described in these qualifiers. Right? A specific factor of production is one that is essential for a particular production process. Okay? You must have that factor to produce any good or service. Okay? 
And I'm going to show you some examples. What's meant by isolable is the conditions under which an isolable, sorry, an isolable factor is one whose marginal revenue product can be isolated from the marginal revenue product of the other factors. And as we'll see, that isn't always the case, particularly when factors are used in what we call fixed proportions. Let me explain with some examples. Okay, simplest example, suppose that there's a, 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 a consumer good or service that is produced with three inputs, A, B, and C. And let's say if you use four units of A, 10 units of B, and two units of C, I can earn $100 worth of revenue. Okay, we'll, we'll forget about discounting for just a moment. Okay? Suppose I use one fewer unit of factor A. Okay, I only use 3A, but I continue to use 10B and 2C. Suppose that I can earn $80 of revenue from selling that output. Okay? Well, then the marginal revenue product of that unit of factor A is $20. In other words, if I start out with 3A, 10B, and 2C, I add another unit of A, I get 20 more dollars of revenue. So if you were to ask, what's the most I'd be willing to pay for one more unit of A if I'm currently using three, I wouldn't pay more than, just want to make sure you guys are still awake late in the afternoon. Okay. And it doesn't mean I want to pay 20, I mean, I'd like to pay one, but I'd be, will, I'd be willing to pay up to $20 because I'd still add a little bit to my profit. I would never pay $21 for another unit of A, okay, if its marginal revenue product is 20. Right? You could imagine a case uh, with what we call fixed proportions. So suppose that you can't really substitute among inputs. Um, if you're using, if, if I have 4A, 10B, and 2C, produces $100 worth of stuff, but I can't just, I can't use one fewer unit of A and continue to use the same amounts of B and C. Right? Think of, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, there's a certain, each worker has to have one machine to work with. Okay, two workers can't share a machine. So if I use one fewer machine, there's no point in employing two workers. I might as well use, employ one fewer worker. Conversely, I can't add another worker without also adding a machine. Okay, it's what we call fixed proportions. Right, and you can imagine that, well, if I go from 4A to 3A, I reduce it by 25%. And do the same thing with my other factors, seven and a half units of B, one and a half units of C, I earn only $75 of revenue. So in this case, the marginal revenue product of factor A is $25, right? It's not only the lost revenue from not having one more, from losing that unit of A, it's the lost revenue from using the complementary units of B and C. Okay, so my revenue goes down by 25 bucks if I choose to use one fewer unit of A. And notice the marginal revenue product there is bigger than it was in the first case, because I'm also losing some of the services of some B and C. Okay? What, we mean that the, what we mean by saying the factor is non-isolable is that you really can't isolate the contribution of factor A independent of factors B and C, because you need them all working together in certain proportions, certain fixed proportions, to get output. Okay? Notice, by the way, th there's no requirement that the marginal revenue products add up to some fixed number. They don't have to add up to sort of the total value of the factors or something like that. That was an error made by the classical economists who defined returns to scale in such a way that the marginal revenue products always added up to the total revenue. And that isn't no reason for that to be the case. I mean, look at the third, look at ex the third example here where we have a specific factor, namely, imagine that, you know, if I have a unit of A, two units of B, three units of C, I can produce $200 worth of stuff. But if I lose my unit of A, I can't produce anything. I can't earn any revenues at all. Okay, so Mark Thornton is an indispensable aspect of the production process. Without Mark, the whole thing just falls apart, and I can't earn a penny of revenue. Well, I mean, then the marginal revenue product of that first unit of factor A is the whole 200 bucks. Okay? Now, what, remember the theory says if the marginal revenue product can be isolated from that of the other factors, then its price tends to be equal to its marginal revenue product or discounted marginal revenue product. Why? Because entrepreneurs are competing against each other for the services of these factors. 
right? And if, if, the, if the factor is currently trading in a price way below its marginal revenue product, there's a profit opportunity, right? Another entrepreneur has an incentive to purchase those factors of production to bid the price up a little bit, take, get those factors of production away from the person paying the low price and be able to earn profit uh, th themselves, okay? Um, but that isn't the case if you have factors that are not isolable. Then all we can say is the, ma the price will never be higher than 25 in the second case and never be higher than 200 in the third case. But we can only, we can only describe some broad range. The exact price just depends on the bargaining ability of the factor owner and the entrepreneur. Okay. Um, let's go back to the theory of imputation a little bit. Uh, the classical economists had what is sometimes described as a cost-based theory of pricing. A cost-based theory of pricing. So they, they thought, well, if we want to explain the prices of goods and services that trade in the market, the prices that consumers pay for goods and services, we have to look at how much it costs to make them. Okay, so if it costs a lot to make something, then the thing will be very expensive when it's, when it's, you know, uh, when it's traded in the market for consumer goods. If it doesn't cost a lot, uh, then it'll be cheap. The great contribution of the Austrian theorists in the 19th century and early 20th century was to say, no, the classical con conception has, has the causality exactly reversed. It isn't the case that the prices that we pay for goods and services are determined by how much it costs somebody to produce them. Rather, how much it costs to produce them depends on how much we are willing to pay for them, how much we value them. For example, an example used by Mises in human action, Look at this picture there. Do we have any, do we have any Frenchmen or French women in, in the, at the conference this year? Anybody from France? Oh, it's fun to have some French people, but because uh, you can pick on them. Uh, does anybody know what what that picture? What's in the picture? Can you see it from the back? Yeah, I mean, it's a vineyard. It's grapes. Actually, this is land in uh, the Champagne region of France. This is very very expensive land. So these are uh, vines producing Champagne grapes that will be made into the fine, expensive champagne, the real champagne from France, not the sparkling wine you get from California. Um, you know, the, cla the classical economists would say, well, you know, when you go buy a bottle of fancy champagne down at the store, you know, it might cost you 100 bucks for the bottle. Why does it cost so much? Well, it's because this land is really expensive. The champagne producers have to pay a lot of money to get the land to grow these grapes. The Austrians said no. That's not, that's not the explanation at all. The question is, why is this land so expensive? Why would anyone be willing to pay an astronomical sum to acquire this tract of land? It's because with this land, you can produce grapes, which are made into a drink that people are willing to pay a lot for. It's precisely because people really like champagne, place a high subjective valuation on consuming champagne, are willing to pay for it, that entrepreneurs bid against each other for the services of this land. The price of this land is bid up to what it is precisely because we consumers place a high subjective valuation on champagne. Okay? I mean, uh, look, uh, imagine that there's some change in consumer preferences. There's, you know, food scare. Like uh, years ago it was Alar and apples and now it's, you know, contaminated dog food, dog food from China. Suppose that there's a you know, somebody opens a bottle of expensive French champagne that's got poison in it. Okay, nobody wants to buy French champagne anymore. What's going to happen to these land prices? They're going to hit rock bottom. Right? The prices are going to fall. Why do you want this land if nobody will buy the thing that you produce using this land? Okay, so the point is it's always consumer preference that drives the pricing process. Okay? It's always consumer preference that drives it. To, to put it in other, in other words, all costs are opportunity costs, right? Opportunity cost being the value of goods or services, consumption goods or services foregone by choosing to consume a particular good or service, right? Well, the cost to the entrepreneur of producing champagne are determined by the value of the other goods and services that we could have had and could have consumed if, that, if those resources, land, labor, capital, and so on, were used to produce something else. 
So it's always the utility foregone that, 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 that is what, what determines the costs that, that producers pay. Um, factor prices tend to equal their discounted marginal revenue products, as we just described, what came to be called the marginal productivity theory. Uh, the, the end result of which is that factors tend to be allocated to their highest valued uses in production. Okay? If the demand for champagne were to fall, we, we, we might very well see this land being converted from vineyards to tourist land. Or maybe it would become a, a, you know, a campsite, or maybe it would become tracked houses. Okay? It might be, might be put to any number of additional uses. Okay? If this land is being used to grow grapes in a competitive market economy, that tells us that growing grapes is the highest valued use of this land. Okay? So when you're driving out in the countryside and you see a beautiful field and they're putting you know, McMansions, neighborhood of McMansions in it, you know, don't be sad. Right? Absent subsidies and other sort of weird government policies, it's probably the case that that land is more valuable as a suburb than it is as a cornfield. Okay, so you can feel all the nostalgia you want tugging at your heartstrings, but again, assuming absence of government intervention, housing might be the highest valued use of that land. Okay. Um, now, so far we've been talking about uh, rental prices. In other words, renting a unit of Mark Thornton's labor or renting the use of a machine, just like we talk about renting a car. Right? But some capital goods, not labor, but physical capital goods, land, machines, and so on, uh, can, you can buy them outright instead of renting them. Right? So what determines the price of a factor production where you're buying the whole factor, uh, buying or selling the entire factor? Well, it's given by sort of the stream of expected future discounted marginal revenue products. Okay, so if I have a machine that can produce a certain, number, certain amount of bottled water per month, right, I think about what do I think the marginal revenue product of that machine will be throughout its usable life, discount appropriately, add, up, add these up, and I get a, a lump sum. Okay, that is how much I'd be willing to pay to own the machine outright rather than renting it. Okay. Um, now, let's talk a little bit more about the entrepreneur and how profit and loss enter the picture. Well, imagine a kind of a, for lack of a better word, call it a long-run equilibrium. Mises used the term evenly rotating economy, or ERE, although that term hasn't completely caught on even within the Austrian literature. But Mises has in mind a, a state of affairs where there's no uncertainty about the future. There's still sort of action, there's still, there's still consumption and production and decisions being made and so on, but it's, they're, they're, again, this is sort of an imaginary state of affairs where the future just keeps repeating itself over and over again. So everybody knows exactly what will happen tomorrow. Producers know exactly what consumer demands will be in the future, exactly how, what resources will be available and so on. Okay? In a world like this, um, all factors of production, including management as a kind of labor, right, will earn, will be paid their DMRP, their discounted marginal revenue product. Capitalists, those who supply capital to the production process, will earn interest, right? So if I own money or machines and I allow an entrepreneur to use those machines, right, the entrepreneur will have to pay me back the value of the machines used or the money that was loaned plus an interest return because I'm getting it back later. Okay, so I lend the entrepreneur $100. That means I don't have the use of my $100, say, for a year. When he pays me back, he has to pay me back $110 or $105. Okay, so the interest that I earn is, in a sense, a reward or return for my foregoing consumption. Okay? So factors of production earn what, uh, what Fetter and Rothbard call rents, or payments to factors equal to their DMRPs. Capitalists earn interest, but there are no other sources of factor income. Specifically, what I mean is there is no entrepreneurial profit or loss. There's no profit in this kind of fictional long-run equilibrium state. Why? Because what's, what, what's profit? Well, that's what's, what's left over. 
right? so the residual that the entrepreneur gets. He sold his goods and services, earned revenues, he's paid all his factors of production, those are his costs. What he has left over is profit. Uh, if he pays out more for factors than he ends up earning in receipts, then he makes a loss. His residual is a negative number. Okay? But in the evenly rotating economy, if all factors are paid their DMRPs, and the DMRP is determined by the value of goods and services to consumers once they're produced, there is no residual. Okay? Every factor gets paid exactly what it's worth in terms of how much consumers value the thing that that factor produces. There's nothing left over for the entrepreneur. There's no profit or loss. Okay? The point of introducing this fictional construct is to say, well, in the real world where we're outside of the ERE, we're not in a fictional state of certainty. There's, I don't know exactly what consumer demand for bottled water will be tomorrow. I, mean, I can make an educated guess, right? And I don't, I don't act blindly. I, make my, I use my, my judgment to anticipate or forecast what I think demand will be, but I could be wrong. Okay? If I believe that I can earn you know, $100 of revenue tomorrow from selling bottled water, and I can acquire the factors of production today for $90, then I'm going to do it. If, I, if I'm right, if I actually can earn $100 tomorrow, I've made a $10 profit. If I'm wrong, if it turns out I can only sell $80 worth of water, then I've earned a $10 loss. Right? The point is that profit and loss can only exist where there is uncertainty about the future. If there's no uncertainty, then no entrepreneur could ever acquire factors of production at a price lower than their DMRP, what they will eventually be worth to the entrepreneur. Okay? This distinction it comes from Frank Knight's book, Risk, Uncertainty, and Profit, which is sort of an odd book because, and Knight is an odd character in the history of economic thought, who viciously attacked the Austrians in the 1940s uh, for, uh, over, in, in a dispute about capital theory, but yet was the first economist to, to, to really explicate in, in detail uh, this theory of profit and loss based uh, on uncertainty, which was adopted by Mises in Human Action. Okay? Um, now let's turn for just a moment to the, the concept of a firm as an organization or a team or a group of people. Okay. Again, in the sort of neoclassical view of the firm, as we saw in those pictures when we first started out, right, the firm is really characterized as a production process or described mathematically as a production function. Right? Y is a function of X. Certain X's are inputs and Y is the output. Uh, you know, exactly how inputs are transformed into outputs is not really explained in the neoclassical approach. The firm, is sort of, the firm is sort of a black box. Inputs go in one end, output comes out the other end. We know how much output we get from using various combinations of inputs, but exactly what goes on inside the black box, we don't know, we don't care. Uh, the so-called principal agent approach to the firm, or agency theoretic approach, to the firm that's popular in law schools, by the way, uh, treats the firm as what they call a nexus of contracts, meaning the firm per se isn't really an interesting economic phenomenon. It's sort of a, an arbitrary legal fiction. Really, all you have is a bunch of different contracts. So Armin Alshin is famously associated with this view, the UCLA econ prominent UCLA economist, that, well, there are contracts between employers and employees, and there are contracts between the firm and its suppliers, and contracts between the firm and its customers, there's just a whole bunch of contracts. And whether we call one inside the firm and another outside the firm really doesn't matter. It's just sort of arbitrary. If somebody's an employee or if they're an independent contractor and not an employee, it's really all the same. Uh, by contrast, the view of the, uh, uh, of the organization that I think is the correct one and the one that comes out of the writings of the Austrian economists and others is to think of the firm in property rights language. Meaning, what is the firm? What is the essence of the firm? What is the nature of the firm? Well, the firm is conceived as ownership of particular assets, particular alienable assets. What is the firm? Well, it's the entrepreneur, or the capitalist entrepreneur, the resource-owning entrepreneur. Or it could be a group of capitalist entrepreneurs, plus the alienable assets that the entrepreneur owns. Okay. So if I uh, am a 
you know, sort of an economics lecturer, and I get paid to give economics lectures, and I own some capital goods. I own a computer and a projector and some pens and paper and other factors of production. Well, then I'm, I'm, I am a firm. Okay, if Mark Thornton and I have a partnership where we produce goods and services using capital goods that we own, then we also are a firm. A, a group of us can pool our resources and hire managers to direct the day-to-day -day operations while we retain equity interest in the firm. And if we decide to make those equity shares exchangeable on a secondary market, then we become a corporation. And, and again, we're a firm. But the point is a firm is a collection of, is, is, a, is one or more entrepreneurs plus a set of capital goods that are owned by that entrepreneur or entrepreneurs. Right? Key to this concept of, the, to this property rights approach, is the idea that owning assets gives you certain rights that you that non-ownership does not give you. Okay, so owning an asset conveys uh, gives you a certain kind of authority in how that asset is to be used. Okay, so unlike a market, unlike market relations, relations within the firm are in an important sense hierarchical. There is hierarchy in the firm. Even if the firm is organized very loosely, where employees are given a great deal of autonomy and so on, there is somebody somewhere who owns the assets of the firm. And the owner or owners possess authority over how those assets will be used. Uh, to use the, the Greek terms that were favored by Hayek, uh, taxis and cosmos. Have you heard those terms before? Uh, Menger used the terms uh, uh, organizations and orders to distinguish among two types of social institutions. Right? So what Hayek called a cosmos, or what Menger called an order, is like the market system itself, a decentralized, orderly set of relations with no central direction, no central authority, as opposed to sort of man-made institutions like the firm, in which there is an owner, and in which the, the, the institution is deliberately designed and created by specific individuals for, to achieve specific purposes, making money, for instance, what Hayek called a taxis, or Menger calls an organization. But my point is there is a distinction between the firm and the market. Okay? We're going to come back to that point in a later discussion this week. But even though you can have, you can have market-like elements within the firm, but you still have an owner, whereas in a market you don't have an owner. Go till five? Okay. Um, I just have another hour or two of material, so I'll get them out of here by seven, no problem. Um, okay, so you're, you are paying attention. Um, also, by the way, if you think about the relationship between the firm as a set of property rights and the firm as a production process, it's not perfectly congruent, right? Meaning that one firm can own a whole bunch of production processes. I can have lots of different factories. Uh, or a single firm may not own any production process at all by itself. It may jointly produce goods and services with another firm. My point is the neoclassical approach is really a theory of the plant, the production plant. It's not a theory of who owns the plant. Okay, does one firm own a bunch of plants? Or is one plant jointly owned by several firms, like in a joint venture, a partnership? Um, the neoclassical theory of the firm is completely neutral with regard to those questions. It's just about inputs and outputs and returns to scale and so on. It doesn't tell you anything about how the assets will be owned and organized. Um, so the, the sort of standard questions, three, three important questions in the theory of the firm, the ownership uh, from an ownership perspective, is why do we have firms? Why do firms exist in the first place? In other words, why not produce goods and services through fully decentralized networks of independent contractors? Why have a boss and workers? Why have owners and subordinates? Uh, what determines the boundary of the firm? How big should it be? How many transactions should be inside? How many should be outside? And how should the firm be set up or designed, organized, and structured? Um, uh, the the uh, approach associated with Ronald Coase's 1937 article, The Nature of the Firm, actually provides a useful framework for thinking about these three questions, particularly the first two. And the Coasean explanation is that the reason for firms, the reason goods and services are produced within organizations that are owned by somebody, 
who directs the, the process of production, is because contracting on the market, transacting with people on the market, involves a certain, certain kind of cost. Costs of finding people to trade with, of having sort of reference points for, for price negotiations, of negotiating prices, writing contracts, enforcing contracts, and so on. Right? I mean, it's costly to do that. You can imagine uh, you know, the, coming here to the Mises University. Right? Imagine there was no Mises Institute. There was no Lou, no Lou Rockwell, no one organizing the Mises University, but rather a group of you just sort of decided spontaneously on your own, gee, I would love to have a week-long program in Austrian economics and policy and history and philosophy. Uh, I, let me get together with you know, 99 of my close friends and see if we can sort of pool our resources and put this thing together. Do you want to do it? Yeah, let's all do it. Great. Uh, where can we do it? Well, we've got to find a, you know, a, a facility, meeting rooms and, and equipment, projectors and lights and electricity and so on. We have to find uh, lecturers. Okay. Uh, we have to find or, you know, people to help with the administration and people to do the name tags and print up the schedule and people to collect the money and people to arrange the accommodations and people to help with transportation and so on. I mean, in principle, a hundred of you could organize this as sort of a network of independent transactions, uh, but it'd be a huge pain to do that. It'd be a lot of negotiation and organizing and it would not be a very efficient means of, of putting something like that together. Instead, the Mises Institute does all the organizing for you. Okay, each of you contracts with the Mises Institute. I will come and attend and I'll pay you or I'll accept a scholarship offer or whatever. And then the Mises Institute hires the professors and, and arranges for the electricity and the screen and so on. Okay? Um, there's an interesting section of uh, Frank Knight's book, Risk, Uncertainty, and Profit, uh, where he explains or introduces the idea that the judgment exercised by the entrepreneur in how capital assets will be used is not itself a good or service that can be traded on the market. In other words, judgment is, by its nature, decisions about how goods that you own will be used. Okay, so if I own productive factors, I must make decisions about whether those factors will, will sit idle or whether they'll be used to produce this or used to produce that. And that making those decisions is exercising entrepreneurial judgment. Now, I can hire a consultant to give me advice, right? But I can't hire someone else to hold the ultimate decision rights for me because by the nature of ownership, I hold those ultimate decision rights. Okay, the, the point being, if a resource owner or if I, if I have an idea for producing bottled water or organizing a week-long summer institute or whatever, if I want to put that into practice, I need to own some assets. Okay, I need to own some factors of production. The only way that I can exercise my entrepreneurial judgment, and there, therefore I start a firm. Okay, uh, Why is the firm not bigger than it is and not smaller than it is? Okay, uh, Why are firms of a definite fixed size? Well, the Kosian explanation has to do, again, with these costs of transacting that there are costs of exchange in the marketplace, as we just described, and there, but there are also costs of organizing activities in a firm. There are internal organizational costs, motivating your employees, monitoring them, and so on, offering rewards and punishments, the costs of managing, in, in a sense, in essence. And so, depending on the relative magnitudes of those external transaction costs, and what we might call the internal transaction costs, the managing or organizing costs, uh, depending on those relative magnitudes, the firm will be either bigger or smaller. In other words, where the external transaction costs are high and the internal managerial costs are low, it will be profitable for the entrepreneur to expand his activities, to take more transactions out of the market and put them inside the firm. Conversely, where the managerial costs are high and relative to market contracting costs, the entrepreneur will find it profitable to, to spin off some transactions, to sell off some assets, to outsource some activities, and so on. Um, if, if you like, you can think of this, you think of these managerial costs as really, really a theory of entrepreneurial ability or talent. Right? The question is, over what range of activities can the entrepreneur profitably exercise his judgment? 
That depends on the talent or skill or ability of the entrepreneur. Some entrepreneurs will be able to organize very large scale activities, big firms, while others will be restricted to a more a, a narrower set of activities, smaller firms. Um, uh, Rothbard offered a, a very important, uh, added an important element to the story in Man, Economy, and State, and in a follow-up article uh, on the socialist calculation problem, or the need for economic calculation in terms of real money prices, as placing uh, sort of a, a limit on how big any firm can be. And a lot of people used to worry about sort of this cartel problem, that, well, you know, what if a bunch of large firms get together and merge, and they control more of the market, and then they keep on merging, and eventually, you know, one giant cartel controls all production in the world. You know, all, all goods and services are produced by Walmart, let's say, hypothetically. Okay, and then they the have monopoly power and consumers will be taken advantage of and blah, blah, blah. And Rothbard points out that, well, no, you, you could never have production organized in one big firm because then it would be a socialist economy. There would be no markets, no exchange, no real markets. You would simply have the problem of one decision maker over all goods and services in the world. And such, such a, a, a huge, gigantic, ultra, super Walmart that owns the whole world would not be able to operate effectively, could not allocate goods and services efficiently, because there are no markets for factors of production, and therefore no prices, no markets on which factor prices can emerge, as we discussed in our the previous few slides. Um, how should the firm be organized? Well, I, here we have questions about the delegation of the owner's authority. So does the owner exercise a lot of sort of day-to-day -day discretion with a very short, strict hierarchy? Or does the owner choose to delegate a wider range of decisions to subordinates? Notice that the owner can never completely delegate all responsibility because it is in the nature of ownership to exercise a certain kind of authority. Okay? You, can, you can allow employees to do whatever you want, uh, but you can, the fact that you can take those, you can take that authority away if you want. Okay, because you own the stuff, gives you a kind of discretionary authority that the employee doesn't have as a non-owner, even if you de facto allow him to do various things. So essentially, we want a theory of the benefits and costs of delegating particular decisions to subordinates. It's thinking about sort of the organizational architecture of the firm. And there's a big literature on this. Okay, so bottom line, what are you supposed to get out of this? The takeaways, as business school professors like to say, um, First of all, the first one is that, that, that Austrian economics does offer a unique, a distinct, and a valuable theory of production. It's not, as is sometimes believed, even by some Austrians, it's not, just, it's not merely a, a verbal rendition of neoclassical production theory. Okay, we all agree that the Austrian theory of production uses much less math than the standard approach, although we use some algebra and we as we did in one of our slides. Um, but we're not simply restating neoclassical theory in words rather than symbols or graphs. We're actually offering a unique, causal, realistic approach to the production process and to the organization of the firm. And as I say, it's a causal, realistic analysis uh, of how factors are priced, how factors are used. It's grounded in marginal utility theory, in the concept of subject subjective value, introduced as, as described by Menger in his, in his pioneering work. It emphasizes the economic and not merely the technological aspects of production. At the same time, this is, uh, there's still a lot, of, a lot of work that remains to be done by Austrian economists. So those of you who are students looking for research topics, whether you're undergraduates or graduate students, uh, there are a lot of great thesis and dissertation topics in Austrian production theory and the Austrian theory of the firm. A lot of questions yet to be answered. Uh, the theory of rent is, really hasn't been advanced a whole lot since Rothbard's uh, interpretation of Frank Fetter. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done on this question of delegation, the internal organization of the firm, relating uh, the theory of production and the theory of the firm to the theory of the business cycle is an important project that has only, uh, only a small amount of which has been done. We need to have more detailed uh, and, and systematic critiques of the standard sort of cost curve approaches that you find in the textbook and uh, 
and, and, even, and, and much more along those lines. So we have a few minutes for some questions, and I'd be happy to take some now. And of course, I'll be around the rest of the week for questions that you don't get a chance to ask just now. Uh, yes, we'll go here first and then in the back. Um, in, a, in a real free market, uh, do you think the economies of scale and uh, average firm size would tend to be uh, smaller or larger? Mm. And how much of a difference do you think would make? Okay, so the question is, um, you know, given that we, we are in a mixed economy now, right, we have a highly interventionist economy, uh, if we had a complete, pure free market with no government intervention, would firms tend to be bigger than they are now or smaller than they are now? Okay. Uh, let me, first let me say, I mean, that's not a question that praxeology can answer. That's really an empirical question. I mean, let's do it and see <laughs> would, be, would be the easy answer. Um, I will say this, though, that there are some... Um, free market advocates who are very strongly convinced that in a pure free, free market, firms would be much smaller than they are today. That you, you, wouldn't have lar you wouldn't have corporations at all. We'll talk later in the week about whether the corporation is legitimate or a sort of a state creation. I think it is legitimate. Uh, that we would have you know, small-scale household production or worker-owned co-ops and this sort of thing. Well, I mean, it certainly is true that the modern corporation receives a heck of a lot of government subsidy, direct and indirect. At the same time, there are a lot of interventionist policies that are directed against large firms, everything from antitrust policy, some kinds of regulation. M many countries have uh, subsidies for small firms, new firms, uh, awards for budding entrepreneurs, education programs, and so on. So there's a lot of intervention that helps big firms, and there's a lot of intervention that helps small firms. It isn't obvious ex ante which one outweighs the other. It, it might very well be that in a pure free market, the, the, the net effect would be that firms would be larger than they are now rather than smaller. But ultimately, we would have to perform the experiment with real people to find out. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's a good, good question. The question is, what, in a pure free market, would, you still, would there be a role for nonprofit organizations? Well, my answer is yes, absolutely there would be. Right? I mean, the family is a nonprofit organization. Religious organizations are nonprofit. Charities are nonprofit. I, I, I don't think there's any reason why we wouldn't have those in a, in a free market. But the problem, sort of the theory of the nonprofit firm is a little bit different from the theory of the for-profit firm, mainly because while nonprofits... I mean, they also purchase factors of production, and they use them to produce goods and services. However, nonprofit organizations don't sell their output on the market. I mean, they, they may have some for-profit, they may have some services for a fee, but a nonprofit doesn't have a, sort of a bottom line the way a for-profit firm does. Okay, the objective is not to maximize the difference between revenues and costs. The objective is religious instruction or taking care of children or helping the sick and needy or whatever the objective of the nonprofit organization is. A really good uh, reference on this is Mises' 1944 book, Bureaucracy, short book that has a great treatment of the socialist calculation problem, where Mises points out that uh, what he calls bureaucracies, by which he means organizations that don't produce stuff they sell on the market, like a police department, for example. He says those organizations cannot be managed in the same way that for-profit firms can be. A for-profit firm, a firm that is, sells its output in the market, can be much more decentralized because you can hold division heads and so on accountable by looking at profit and loss statements. You look at the income statement. You, uh, you do whatever you need to do to make money, and I'll be happy if you make money. You can't do that if you're producing output that may be valuable but isn't priced because you don't have the same signals of success or failure. So those organizations must, must be managed in a much more hierarchical, rule-oriented fashion. Um, so yes, th certainly there would be such organizations, I would expect, uh, but they would be managed differently than profit-seeking firms. Thank you, hey, thank you Mark. Thank you, Peter.